Tūtawa mai i runga, tūtawa mai i raro, tūtawa mai i waho, tūtawa mai i roto. Kia tau ai te mori tū, te mori ora ki te katoa. Homie, huie, taikie. Tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai haere mai, ko Phil Jones a hou. Uh, welcome all to this uh, webinar um, with Rod Oram on, on COP26. Um, I welcome all, I, I dare say, many of you uh, who have joined, uh, perhaps also joined the first webinar we had with uh, Rod two weeks ago. Um, so we're delighted to have Rod back for this kind of look back, almost look back at uh, what's been happening at COP26. Um, so what we're obviously hugely grateful and privileged to um, have Rod available to, to talk to us this evening. He's been a good friend, as I mentioned two weeks ago, uh, of, of the Sustainable Business Network for many years. So really welcome um, and the, the chance for this uh, for us to learn more about what's happened at COP over the last two weeks. Um, so this will be an hour long. Um, we'll, Rod will kind of give his thoughts um, on COP for about 20 or so minutes, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please um, be free to use the Q&A um, to ask your questions. Um, and also you're welcome to use the chat if you want to, especially for example, introduce yourself, um, let us know who's, who's out there in the audience, that would be welcome. Um, but please do use the Q&A and we'll get through as many questions as we can. Um, I'm sure there are many, many out there. So yes, yeah, so two weeks ago, Rod joined us for a preview of the conference. Um, and you know, the, formally the conference ends tomorrow, midnight UK time. Um, so we're delighted to host him again for, for this almost look back. Um, and certainly from my perspective, I've been following the, um, the you know, the events um, for the last two weeks. It seems to have been a real whirlwind. Um, perhaps as much a conference of the pledges as a conference of the parties. There's been so many uh, big announcements made, so it'd be really interesting to hear Rod's view on, on some of those. Um, I've been hugely grateful to Rod for his updates that he's provided through the newsroom um, website and also the, you know, the webinar specials and the little audio interviews of various um, people at COP, been hugely interesting to follow that and also to follow those other correspondents from New Zealand who are at the conference. Um, so yeah, Rod has written 15 articles in the, in the last two weeks. So I'm sure many of you out there have been following those with um, regularity. So Rod, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, pass over to you and thanks again. Uh, Kilda Sato, thanks, Phil, and a great pleasure to be back with you all. And thank you for all joining me. Um, and slightly later than you might normally, this is to accommodate me because it's 6 30 in the morning. And um, I had my uh, video off there because I was still finishing my porridge. Um, just before I came up to Scotland, I ran across a fabulous, uh, wonderful Samuel Johnson uh, quote. Oh, gosh, that would be from the 18th century. Uh, oats. Um, a forage that the English feed to their horses and the Scots eat themselves. And um, that I hope, <laughs> although I'm a huge fan of porridge, it's kept me going uh, at COP just as it does at home. Um, I will only say a bit now because I'm really, really keen to hear what's on your minds and um, try and give you the best answers I can. But in order to um, frame my answers in a sense. I thought it might be worth starting with how, as a journalist, I've been trying to navigate these through these last two weeks. The first thing I'd say is that um, there is so much going on here, it's impossible to genuinely capture um, a mood of the meeting um, because there's 40,000 people here and there's probably about 100,000 separate story threads going on here at any one time because in a sense COP is intensely personal as you um, live and experience and, and work through it yourself. Um, so I 
set out each day with a couple of things in mind. One is the theme of the day, because the presidency of COP, uh, the UK, had um, unusually for COP um, set a theme of the day, and it brings a certain focus around a given subject. So yesterday uh, was sustainable transport, for example, and today is built environments. Um, of course, those subjects are discussed every day, um, but it does give a bit of a focus. The next thing I'm keeping an eye on are for big issues that are very important to us in New Zealand. So I am uh, selective in that sense. But a very important thing I'm not doing is I'm not trying to keep up uh, with giving um, you all back home an overall sense of what's going on here. So um, yes, Obama gave a wonderful speech, but that's very widely reported elsewhere. So you can find um, far um, more expressive journalists than I am capturing that. So I, I by and large, just leave that alone. Um, but I am looking for those little facts each day that um, help um, sort of set um, COP in context. So I'm looking for those nuggets. But I'm also, of course, trying to give a sense of the overall direction. One last thing about how I have selected what I do each day is there's essentially um, three things going on in here at COP. The first one is the negotiations between government delegations. So that's um, uh, ministers uh, and lots of heads of state at one time or another. There's been about 140 heads of state here. And um, in their absence, there are senior politicians um, on the delegations and then lots of um, political staff, civil servants. So that's the negotiations. They are incredibly important. They are also incredibly arcane and intricate. And I make zero effort um, to follow the nuances there um, and the state of play in negotiations. I'm very keen on what the outcome is, and I will report that extensively at the end. Um, but I'm not spending each time, uh, day each, uh, time each day um, trying to interview lots of people to, to get the latest story on how those are going. Um, there is a wonderful resource, which I gave a link to early, in one of my earlier uh, newsroom pieces called um, Earth Negotiations Bulletin. And this is run at not just COP, but many other international organizations like it by um, a Canadian NGO, highly respected. And um, its role is to provide, uh, to, to be, it is authorized to have um, a, a reporter in each of the negotiating sessions to be able to note the key points of it, to put that and the flavor of the, that session and, and how that stream of negotiations is going as a service to delegates who they can get that um, summary each day. Um, so for all the things they miss, they can um, get a, a, a good steer from uh, Earth Negotiation Bulletin. It's extremely authoritative, um, very highly respected, and it's staffed by an incredible bunch of people. Um, I've um, mentioned one um, briefly, uh, Natalie Jones, uh, who is a New Zealander. Um, she did her PhD in international law at Trinity College, Cambridge, and she's now a postdoc fellow in the Cambridge Centre for Existential Crises, which I think must be an extraordinary place to be, very interdisciplinary. Um, so that's the calibre of people um, who write those pieces. And um, even if you're not interested in the um, uh, report on the actual sessions themselves or the themes, down at the bottom, they have this slightly gossipy thing called In the Corridors, which gives you a little bit of a flavor about negotiations. Um, and uh, so Earth um, Negotiations Bulletin, um, easily found online, um, is, is fantastically good value. So that's essentially how I start out my day uh, with those sorts of um, framing in mind. But then the most remarkable thing about COP is the sheer serendipitousness, I'm not sure that's quite a word, where um, I turn up somewhere or, uh, sorry, I, I do have scheduled things, uh, but I find myself somewhere or talking to someone that um, is immensely interesting and immensely helpful. And um, I, I, quite honestly, some of my uh, most interesting um, 
things I've been picking up have come that way. So that's essentially how I go about my day. And then I then have to spend, uh, uh, happily spend, um, about three and a half hours in the afternoon uh, running up to my 5 p.m. local time here in Glasgow deadline for filing to newsroom. So um, Tim and Jono and Cass and my colleagues back at newsroom can um, put that out first thing in the morning, 7 a.m., because it's they're 13 hours ahead, so it lands at 6 a.m. in the morning, and they have it out by 7. And then after I've done that, I go off and do some more things. So that's the basic structure of my day. And um, this picture behind me is of the COP campus. Um, I'll, I'll move slightly out of the way. Um, the um, big building on the right of the crane is the Ovo Hydro, which is the action hub. Um, and it's a fabulous place. It's a big um, circular um, amphitheater covered uh, where they have rock concerts and other such stuff. And this is an enormous globe hanging in the middle of it, um, slowly turning. Rather sadly, uh, it, and it's got wonderful cloud cover over most of the globe or parts of the globe, um, but rather appropriately, um, you can hardly see New Zealand because in this globe it's covered in cloud. So not the long white cloud, it's kind of like over a big patch of the South Pacific. And um, the Action Hub is a, a fabulous place to be because it's bean bags and uh, comfy chairs and uh, meetup places. And, and that's where um, there's a lot of stuff going on from the civil society sector. Um, uh, NGOs are doing lots of formal things out in various um, meeting rooms and presentation rooms. Um, but the Action Hub is, is where you get that um, a collision of people and ideas to great effect. It's wonderful um, hanging out there and chatting to people. Um, over on the left is the um, Armadillo, uh, sorry, uh, on that side is the Armadillo, which is a smaller venue um, and um, used for um, smaller concerts and the like. And in there, <clears throat> there's a series of um, uh, forum rooms, if you like, <clears throat> again, for NGOs and um, civil society. Then between them, um, it, which you can't see behind the crane, is a very big um, ex um, permanent exhibition area. And in there, the, called the Scottish Event Centre, in there are um, a huge number of um, pavilions, uh, all in a big space, like a trade fair. I mean, this is the um, climate this is the climate trade fair, if you like. And um, they're completely wonderful because um, lots of countries, um, NGOs, um, business groups and the rest um, have pavilions in there. And there's very active programs going on there. Um, and it's just, you know, an enormous variety of things. Then um, tying together all of those three buildings is an extraordinary complex of temporary buildings. Um, which um, I think at the most are two story high. And, the, um, and a great uh, thoroughfare runs through all this, um, uh, the, through that main exhibition area, that, that's a permanent thoroughfare, but it extended either way. And that thoroughfare is very long. And once I'm through security in the morning, it's a brisk um, 15 minute walk um, from there to the media center at the far end of the complex, at the um, west end of the complex. And the um, and then there is lots off to the side, such as um, a great cluster of uh, country offices and a um, offices for the UN, and then lots and lots of negotiation session uh, rooms, a whole rabbit warren of them, off one way and off, and then the other, uh, the main plenary rooms. Um, the Cairn Gorm is the largest, named after the tallest mountain in Scotland, a fabulous mountain to climb or walk up, and 4,406 feet high, as I remember from my childhood. And um, so Cairn Gorm is uh, big enough to have um, every country in there, a few people at each uh, country table, and then room for a few more, uh, quite some other observers. Uh, both behind the table and then at the back of the room and then lots of media. So a big place. And um, then there's a, a, a smaller plenary which is used extensively but can't hold as many people. And then there's lots and lots of other stuff. So that's the basic campus. And um, so that's how I spend my day. I try to get to the campus about eight in the morning um, 
so if the security queue which early on was taking half an hour to get through it's be speedier these days um uh is so i'm not delayed to it's a, if i am delayed at security i've still got plenty of time and my my day is running till sort of eight o'clock or so in the evening um and before i come back to my um accommodation which I'd, I'd love to just briefly mention there is a fabulous um czech ngo called human hotel that has a terrific website and for all sorts of international meetings like cop um it works with um uh, citizens living in the, those cities um, to um, line them up as hosts with delegates like me. And um, it's a very modest sum and I'm staying with a delightful host and uh, who's making me feel very much at home. And uh, I'm only about a 20 minute walk from here to the perimeter fence of COP and the main entrance. Um, but it, it takes me often a good half an hour uh, of, through security and then another sort of further 10 minute walk to um, the media center. So um, I'm lucky to make the journey from uh, a comment from my um, host's home to um, the media center in under an hour. So it's kind of a long commute. But on that long commute, I spend, uh, I ruminate on what I uh, have been thinking and make some more plans. So th that's basically what life is like at COP, um, completely extraordinary. Uh, I will, one other comment about the sort of people here. For me, they, so many people I talk to have this extraordinary blend, which I think is absolutely the place, um, well, I, we need to be, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take them as my role models um, back home. Um, for me, they blend three characteristics. The first one is they are utterly steely eyed about how great the crisis is and how short a time we have to solve it. They are totally on top of that. They understand it perfectly. It motivates them very highly. The second thing, though, is they are extremely creative about the solutions that they, they well, if we if not that this or yes we've got to do this but we, perhaps we do this that the other so um uh, very focused very creative um and haven't seem to have an un um unremitting unrelenting um sense of uh, purpose and um uh, op, op, uh, uh, and uh, uh, an optimism about what they're doing i'm sure like we all do they also have times when it's just like oh, it's just too hard and they probably get a bit despondent too, I'm sure. Then the third thing is they are incredibly willing to collaborate uh, with whoever they um, need and can find. And very, very interestingly, I can't get the data on this yet from the UN, but it seems to me that the median age of delegates here um, is no higher than late 30s, possibly younger than that. What I have heard about the negotiations in many country delegate delegations, there are some extremely talented young people um, on in the government party, civil servants in negotiating teams who exhibit those sorts of characteristics. Um, so whereas their seniors in the country delegation might be sticking to um, long held views of that country on a particular issue and the standard positions to say no to anything else that comes along or be very defensive about what comes along. These young people in these delegations are, are trying, obviously not to annoy their, their elders and their bosses, but to, um, to seek out ways through that. And, and so they're, they're exhibiting those sorts of characteristics in the negotiations, which I find um, incredibly encouraging and um, a, a very good sign of um, a, 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 a useful, an important dynamic here. And one that has changed over the years because that demographic has become far more representative. There's sort of a gender balance, or, although men, there's data on this, um, hog up a, a vast majority of the speaking time in plenary sessions, even though there are women in the room. There's UN data on that. And, um, you know, good representation from indigenous people and different cultures and all the rest. Um, but I think it's that growth of the younger delegate, which is really important. Lastly, um, oh, I should have met, kept, meant to keep my timer going. Uh, I'll make this very brief. 
Lastly, um, we're down now to the last two days of negotiation, Thursday and Friday. It's um, early Thursday morning here. And technically, COP has to finish at midnight on Friday. It will probably stray into the early hours of Saturday morning. And they won't make, I hope, the mistake of the previous COP in Madrid, uh, where it went on for some days afterwards, and it only became more dysfunctional as the time went on. So they achieved even less. Um, whereas in Paris, uh, they did stray into the early hours of morning, but managed to um, pull off a big agreement. We won't here get a big agreement like Paris. And we don't need one because that gives us the overall architecture. So what we're looking for here um, are some substantial improvements on Paris. And the main issue on the table is whether countries increase their NDC, their nationally determined contribution, their UN climate pledge, every year as opposed to every five years. And there's a clear split amongst the delegations here. Um, countries like the US, uh, the EU as a group, the UK, um, all are pushing for um, annual um, or even faster if you want to do it, um, updates on your NDC. And countries like um, China and Russia are pushing back on that. Um, so where we get on NDCs is really important. And we will end up with a number, a, a, a theoretical number about what the temperature rise is kept to. That's a useful number to have. But the way that the UN is calculating that, it's based on countries delivering all the things they say they're going to deliver. So that's why the report from Carbon Action Tracker this week was such a shock, because they do a different analysis, which they uh, an, analyze an NDC on a country's current um, policies and gives you a figure on that. And then on its proposed policies. Um, and again, that's based on the assumption that those proposed policies actually work out. And, and, and Climate Action Tracker is still coming up um, with a far higher number than the UN, because policies don't yet meet those commitments. So that's the big theme um, about um, NDCs to watch out for. The second one is about policies and pathways. And this COP has been particularly busy with all kinds of alliances, declaration statements, whether it's on coal or deforestation, um, you name it, there's been a declaration on it with various countries signing up for it. The big one to keep an eye on, not just at COP, but over the next few years, very intensely, is the Global Methane Pledge, um, led by the US and the EU, calling for a 30% reduction in methane emissions, human-induced, by 2030. Um, and whilst that's initially focused on the um, oil and gas sector, particularly methane leaking from gas pipelines, um, uh, agriculture is absolutely in the frame because agriculture is a bigger source of methane than the oil and gas industry. It's the largest source. And so there is a lot of work going on here on sustainable agriculture. And uh, I've been trying to convey that as a big theme back to New Zealand. And in fact, that's my main goal today, um, to land some more on that for tomorrow, um, hopefully. Then finance is a big one. It's ridiculous that de developed countries have still not met their Paris 2015, sorry, it was a yeah, 2015 um, pledge of 100 billion US dollars a year to developing countries. They're still short on that. Meanwhile, there are negotiations for a new framework to come into effect by COP29 in 2024 for a whole new method of um, assessing that and some eye-watering numbers are being demanded by developing countries. Um, uh, rather interestingly, Saudi Arabia is apparently the most extreme at one and a half trillion dollars globally um, on the grounds that it has going to have to stop burning fossil, uh, selling fossil fuels in due course. Um, and then the other big thing to look for is what's going on around nature. Lots of great declarations on that. Um, and we're beginning to see um, the, the co-crises of climate and biodiversity loss coming together, but in no way in a coherent enough form. Then, so that's the negotiations. And then the next thing is um, the uh, amazing civil society programs here. Um, it's very exciting as a business journalist to see um, business uh, really having the bit between its teeth on this, um, of far greater um, sophistication, uh, awareness, capability, commitment, and ramping up of ambitions. 
And the key, key um, benchmark to hold everybody to, uh, and every business should has to be working to this, is um, emissions that are consistent with the one and a half degree pathway, i.e. 50% reduction by 2030, net zero by 2050, um, um, derived and measured under the science-based target initiative, so absolutely science-based and monitored. Um, and thirdly, um, um, focused on net zero. So that's what everybody has to work to. The very big help contribution the UN made this week was to propose a new program. It's going to be very big, very extensive to monitor the civil society net zero pledges, which are turning up all over the place um, from cities and local governments to businesses. Um, and I think that's a, a really worthwhile, hugely important piece of transparency to bring to this. And um, then one last thought is that um, too much of the time, I feel this conversation is about um, a price-driven, business-led um, economic evolution here, transformation to a low carbon economy. Yes, that's true, but there is no way that we can or should be measuring um, all our efforts on climate and biodiversity on the basis of what's the price, what's the cost, what's the benefit, economic benefit, even widely um, uh, defined. So for me, what is not coming through nearly strongly enough is about um, a commitment by humanity to um, reestablish its right relationship with all the living systems of the earth, our life support system, and, um, and approach that in that to Al Mari's sense of worldview, um, rather than just narrowly from an economic lens, even a more sophisticated economic lens that factors in, um, you know, just transitions and human capital and social capital and all the rest, that and natural capital, th that's fine. But if this was deeply, deep, all this was deeply, deeply grounded in that re right relationship um, with the living earth. Um, that's ultimately where we need to get to. Sorry, I've spoken far too long. I've taken up almost half an hour. I didn't mean to. Um, and I'm very eager to hear uh, what's on your mind, please. Fantastic, Rod, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so much to cover. Um, really interesting to hear your observations about the, you know, the day-to-day the -day life in the conference campus. Um, and obviously what's going on in, in the various rooms and, and um, uh, you know, uh, groups, buildings. Um, now, I have a heap of questions. Now, let me, uh, there have been some that have come through on the Q&A. Um, really welcome any other questions that you may have. So please put them in the Q&A box. We'll try to get through them. Um, Let's start with this one. We could either kind of start or end with this one. Um, and you've touched on this already. This is from Adam. Um, do you feel more positive um, about the, you know, our ability to stay within the 1.5 now as against the start of the COP? Um, progress. <laughs> um, the, many, many countries are focusing on that and taking that very seriously. Um, but we're a long way short of it not just in, in terms of pledges, but then in terms of policies and programs to actually deliver on that. So a long way to go. I, I do have, a, um, in, in many ways, an overall greater sense of purpose uh, or, or um, optimism. And quite honestly, that's mostly because um, I'm immersed in this um, extraordinary um, bunch of people here. Uh, I've learned a lot um, in all kinds of ways uh, on all kinds of subjects. So I am coming home um, with, I think, a, a, a deeper, bigger, um, richer sense of, um, of what we need to do to progress, but also coming home with that, you know, absolutely cold-eyed view of the challenge. Yeah, one of the, um, the most recent um, sort of uh, things that's come through the news is this US-China agreement, um, mm. which 
some commentators here have already commented, you know, commented that it seems quite significant. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've got any views on that. Um, yes, I do. Um, and um, I, I've just noticed I've got 8% battery. I'll plug in my laptop in a moment. Sorry, I should have done that before we started. Um, the important things alluded to me first thing in the morning. Um, that was very unexpected. Um, Kerry had been seen talking to the uh, leader of the Chinese delegation, um, its climate minister, earlier on in the week, um, having a head-to-head, -head, um, a, a close conversation, uh, but nobody thought it would turn out like this. Um, because there's a great deal of um, political tension, um, well, deep strain between the two countries, and um, China had um, President Xi um, Jinping just said he wasn't going to come. But I think what's happened is um, multiple fold. Um, the first one is um, there is real progress here uh, on NDCs. And um, the US has been a, a good force here with Biden. Kerry is particularly impressive. Um, but then a really interesting thing happened. I'm going to write about this today for the newsroom tomorrow. Um, I went to the press conference with Nancy Pelosi when she was introducing um, her um, House of Representative Democrat colleagues. And up front were five chairs of um, committees in the House, climate, um, energy, you know, you name it, they were there. And they all they did a tag team um, introducing each other. And they all said, the US is back. We're going to lead the world on this. And Pelosi was very impressive. There was a large gaggle of representatives in the front two rows. She um, faultlessly named off every one of them and they stood for applause and all the rest. So there was this, um, the Chinese would have to be sitting there going, oh, uh, we need to match this diplomatic offensive. And um, it would not be impossible for President Xi to suddenly turn up. That would have been too obvious. Um, but um, to get together on and say, well, let's work together on driving these pledges, that's hugely significant, um, in both in terms of um, some rapprochement between them, at least on this, if not on other things, but crucially because the two of them speaking together um, um, uh, is incredibly powerful. The world's first and second um, largest emitter. Um, India had already made a, an unexpectedly bold pledge at the very beginning, and it is currently the third largest economy, and in a few years will overtake the US. So at the big end of town, um, there is some action. And um, when I spotted that news late yesterday, I thought that that's um, probably the most dramatic single intervention we could have had in these negotiations. It sounds like, um, from what I understand, the draft agreement that has been published is not that um, impressive or um, doesn't set a great expectation, um, quite modest in some of its language and what it's saying. Um, but one thing that struck me was that uh, there was in the initial draft the comment specifically about reducing the use of fossil fuels, and I think coal in particular, which seems extraordinary. And apparently this is the first time it's you know, explicitly appeared in um, an agreement of this type, which seems extraordinary in the 26th COP. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the draft agreement, um, understandably, <clears throat> is um, <clears throat> pretty lame <clears throat> in language and ambition. Um, <clears throat> but the good thing is that it's published, um, so um, th there can be a, a suitable amount of fury about the lack of ambition. Um, but the really important thing at this, uh, the, the early, well, it was early stages of negotiation, um, is that it does actually significantly move Paris on, um, particularly if we do get those annual upgrades of NDCs and in mentioning fossil fuels for the first time. So the, the, the real issue now is trying to harden those up considerably. Um, obviously, the wonderful goal that had been hoped for is um, a, an absolute firm deadline for um, no more coal-fired um, ele uh, electricity plants, uh, electricity generation. Um, I, 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 I can't judge whether we're gonna get there. I, I'd be, lots of people be thrilled if we do, um, but maybe not. So that's, so in essence, um, 
the outline of a good agreement is there. So now the intense two days um, is to give it real heft is what's going on here. Thank you. Um, a question from Andrew. Um, there's, I'll read this. There seems to be so much talk about target setting and less examples of actual emissions reductions. Is COP providing a platform for the decent exchange of proven strategies of how the world can actually reduce emissions fast enough? Yes, the, the um, program is enormous um, out in um, all those civil society and NGO um, pavilions, often with governments involved. So, for example, yesterday I was in a session on sustainable um, aviation fuel. Uh, I went to two of them. Uh, one of them was led by the World Economic Forum, which has a big project on this, and the other one by the UK government, um, which is working with the UK aviation industry on the uh, Jet Zero Council. So you do get... Um, uh, governments very actively involved. So uh, there is a huge amount of knowledge sharing, absolutely. And that's why I think it's a great shame our New Zealand delegation is um, so small um, uh, uh, and the few people who are here are in absolutely buried in the negotiations. Um, and um, I think it's a great, great shame there isn't a, a, a significant number of senior civil servants here from New Zealand who are the policy makers and they really, really need their eyes opened uh, to what's going on in the rest of the world, especially as we're trying to set an emissions reduction plan, um, which is going to be very demanding in terms of policy. And I, I have a really serious worry that um, we just won't be devising policy that um, is at the leading edge, which, which is the only place to be. Yeah, um, you've kind of answered the, a question here. So that this was what, if any, impact on our domestic strategies and policies do you think COP will have, in particular the ERP? Um, and um, yes, yeah, so you, I think you've kind of answered that, unless there's any further things. Well, I, I just add one point. Um, um, in a session that um, Shaw was speaking in yesterday on um, TCFD, the um, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, uh, I didn't go to, I saw the recording afterwards. He mentioned that his first COP, he was a part of the delegation, but he was in, as an opposition MP in the Green Party. And um, of course, um, um, Stuart Smith, the uh, National Party um, climate spokesman, um, very um, clearly stated why he wasn't coming. Uh, and I just find it incredible that somebody in that position who theoretically, if there was a change of government by the next climate minister, uh, wasn't here to immerse himself in that. And any um, excuse about M MIQ, of course, went away in the in the last bit. That was easy. And I just find it, un I, I have to use the word, unconscionable um, for um, people in politics and business and others who should have been here uh, weren't. Uh, uh, and um, I particularly would finger um, the National Party in that. Yeah, it's it's um, extraordinary the stick that uh, the minister got for, you know, having the audacity to go to Glasgow uh, to attend this conference. It's, yeah. it's extraordinary. Well, um, I, I just, I'll just touch on that, actually, because um, there's these work streams going on and the UN chooses um, co-chairs of those work streams and they tend to pair a developed country with a, a less developed country. Size of country is not crucial and um, it's based mostly on um, the individual's deemed knowledge and skills. Mm -hmm. So Shaw is chairing with the um, health, well-being and environment minister of Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean, the transparency work stream, which is incredibly important because um, it's um, what the the Paris Agreement needs so everybody can see exactly what everybody else is doing in terms of emission reductions and the nature of their pledges. And it's a very difficult issue because the developing countries are saying, oh, what's proposed, and I have a lot of sympathy for this, is far too complicated. We just don't have the resources or all those um, things we have to report on, many of them don't apply to us. So Shaw's, um, uh, um has got a, a very difficult job there. Um, so he's playing an important role there. Mm. Um, there is another mm. NZ specific question here. What is your sense of whether other or what other countries feel or whether other countries feel uh, we are doing enough as a country? You know, are we generally seen as, you know, leaders, laggards, followers? 
insofar New Zealand crosses anybody's mind, which as I've discovered is not very often, uh, and that's partly because we have a, such a low profile here. So for example, at the last COP, there was a wonderful Pacific pavilion that um, New Zealand um, was a major host with in order to bring um, our Pacific neighbors, um, give them a, a better platform at COP. And none of that's here. Um, the, our delegation still supporting the, um, helping to support um, the political delegations from um, those Pacific countries in negotiations and the like. Um, so we've got an extremely low profile here, but we're still trading on our reputation and on our promises. So I've had really knowledgeable people say to me, oh, this was a good one was on agriculture. Oh, New Zealand's doing such a wonderful job on agriculture, you know, you know keep it up. And I said, um, can I just explain a few things about what we're not doing in New Zealand that like we're not going to be a, we haven't committed to anything under the global methane pledge even though we signed up to it and, and we have these incredibly modest targets for reducing methane and not much is happening we're having a long discussion about how farmers might measure and manage and report stuff and um so yeah so the summary is uh we've got uh I think we're nearly invisible here, apart from being useful in the negotiations. We're certainly invisible in the civil society context. Um, and um, uh, insofar as people think about us, um, they think about our past and our promises, not our progress. Mm. Um, uh, it leads on to a, another good question here, um, comparing our what we've done to date with what the Danes have done. You know, what does the Danish um, huge reduction in agricultural emissions teach New Zealand. I don't know if you've had a chance to. Um, yeah, um, I, that's an incredibly good question. And I used to be um, more fluent on this because a few years ago I had a, a deep dive into what the Danes had done. Oh, gosh, the alliteration's tripping off my tongue this morning. <laughs> and um, um, it's, it's a very, very sophisticated story of... Um, um, moving up the value chain in farming a long way. But at the, um, at the farming end, um, of course, the Danes are famous for their pigs and their ham, and they did very, very rigorous stuff on um, pollutants, um, particularly um, nitrates into water, for example. Um, and um, so they have been uh, working on their... Um, farming sector for decades, um, very much focused on that sophistication, um, both on farm, but further up the value chain, it is the simplest way of picking through that. Um, I, I, I will come back to update the Danish story in due course. So it's, it's kind of on my list um, for newsroom. Oh dear. We've lost Rod. I hope that that's probably because he, um, maybe his uh, power socket was not fully plugged in. Um, so we'll <laughs> we'll um, allow a bit of time. Hopefully he will rejoin. Isabel, I don't know if you've got any alternative. Um, I yeah, I assume that group with him. <laughs> I assume his computer's gone down too. Hopefully yeah, yeah. Too long. Yeah. Uh, if you want to add any comments Phil or answer any of the questions from your personal yeah I mean um there have been some great questions and I was going to next you know look into the and Rod's already referred to this in terms of you know agreeing the rule book um for uh you know and covering a number of things so I think two weeks ago Rod said that Paris kind of kicked some of the things down the road and one of them was actually agreeing the rule book and really since Paris it's all been about um, over those, over the subsequent COPs, um, you know, formulating the rule book. And one of the key areas in there, well, there's two key areas, I think he mentioned. One was um, transparency of reporting, and he referred to James Shaw being involved in that, chairing that work stream. Um, and the other one is about the carbon markets um, and agreeing, you know, protocols and rules around international carbon credit trading. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I don't know what the, the current status of that is. Um, I've heard different things, different things have been reported in terms of um, ideas around, for example, 
limiting the percentage of any country's NDC that could be um, met by buying overseas credits, um, which is obviously something which would really penalise our nation, you know, our country's approach in terms of the need for us to meet two thirds of our NDC through um, buying carbon credits. Um, so I was going to ask him that whether he had heard any, you know, insights in into that area. Um, Adam asked that question, um, but I did hear that we were kind of lobbying against that sort of change um, and really having any constraints on the number of um, credits that can be purchased to meet obligations. So yeah, that would be really interesting, and I I, I sense that they're unlikely to agree the rule book by tomorrow evening, but um, hopefully they've made some good progress. Um, yeah, I'd love to ask another question that Kimberly, you've raised. What's the best example you've seen at COP of the kind of wider non-economic worldview um, that Rod was describing? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Look, oh man, I was, I, I, I told you that I should have plugged my laptop in and then I was so busy talking I didn't. I'm sorry about that. I hope you didn't all go away and hope no, trust I, I I'm back. We kept we kept talking about different things. So um okay, good. no one's left. Oh fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> one, one of the th so I, I can't remember. Oh, we were talking about um agriculture and the Danish lessons from uh, Denmark, weren't we? Um but we what I there's a couple of other questions that I wanted to get through, Rod. One is um and I've just talked briefly about this, is progress on the rule book and particularly the carbon markets, um, and what your sense is on where that is heading and to you know how close uh we we are to reaching that sort of agreement. Yeah, um of the various um uh, negotiating streams and topics. This is one I've spent a bit more time on. Um, there is, a, 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 people are saying there's a great determination to um, manage the, art, you know, achieve the Article 6 rule book this time. It's been long in negotiations since Paris. Um, and um, so there are hopes for that. Um, but at the beginning of the week, um, there was in the text still 300 square brackets. So that those are around the words that uh, people can't agree on and are still being negotiated, which is quite a, a load to get through, um, especially on a subject that's been discussed for a long time. So these are clearly sticking points. And, and I haven't heard how many square brackets they're down to at this point. Um, but one adverse element of the negotiation is that um, there is a had been a very big push um, for indigenous rights to safeguard land and have a good grievance process and all the rest to make sure that um, you know vast sums of money flowing into carbon credits didn't overrun land or whatever and um, and that's been um, that seems to have been significantly watered down um, which is very disappointing to um, uh, indigenous groups. Um, and that's true for um, uh, Maori too. Mm. Um, however, so let's, fingers crossed, we'll get there. However, it does, did raise the question as to how New Zealand would cope with if there wasn't a, an Article 6 rule book, seeing as we're going to be amongst the very few countries which are going to be very big purchasers of overseas credit in order to meet our um, NDC because we haven't done enough at home. And um, as I understand it, the view in Wellington is that, yes, we want Article 6 rule book. Um, and so we have uh, good carbon markets, transparent, well-disciplined and all the rest both regulatory, regulated markets, uh, but also voluntary markets. Um, but if that doesn't eventuate, uh, it'll still be possible for New Zealand to buy the credit it needs, um, either in bilateral relationships where we can have confidence about the other country, the other party, uh, or in small multilateral groups that achieve that same sort of discipline. So um, it would, uh, the, that plan B would rather um, limit or, uh, the array of uh, credits which were available. We wouldn't literally have sort of all the world's our oyster, um, but it would still be uh, possible for New Zealand to meet um, its credits that way. Uh, however, I, I, I'm sure I know there's a substantial feeling at home and which I uh, absolutely 
believe too, is that we have to reduce our domestic em emissions. Um, it's economically wrong, it's morally wrong, it's everything else is wrong uh, about relying so heavily on credits. Yes, lots of help to other countries, um, and we should be far more generous on that, uh, but not through um, a, a mechanism um, that funds our um, emissions at home. Um, you mentioned about uh, Indigenous rights, um, and that relates to another question here. Um, and this touches on what you said earlier in terms of broader, we're not just trying to green capitalism, we're actually trying to have a different mm. system. You know, what's the best example you've seen at COP26 of the kind of wider non-economic worldview that you would Oh, describe? heavens. Um, that's a fabulously good question. Um, I... <laughs> It, 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 I, I've never had this problem before in terms of I'm, I'm wrestling so much with themes that um, I, I'm, I'm not focusing as well as on individual um, cases, if you like. Um, but certainly um, in, the, um, in the NGO space and in the civil society space, um, there is um, quite a large emphasis on um, more cooperative ways of arranging economies um, and, um, uh, and the like. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm kind of immediately stumped on that one, um, but I will um, put that front of mind in these oh, next few days if I can <laughs> bring home. Yes, I can imagine there's so much going on. Um, yeah. we, we've got about five minutes to go. Um, um don't think there's oh yes there's one question which actually was in the other uh, channel um yeah it, just the the sort of balance um in terms of what's happening activity between climate mitigation and climate adaptation you know where's the kind of balance across uh cop um again uh, i'm resorting to a, a sweeping judgment here a sweeping statement uh, although it, you know, I'm hearing and quite a lot of people saying this, so I think it's um, it has great validity. There is a far bigger emphasis on mitigation rather than adaptation. So one of the really important work streams is the loss and adaptation work, loss, damage, and adaptation work stream. And um, uh, my sense, well, what I'm picking up is that that hasn't been going that well in terms of certainly in terms of funding, um, but also um, in terms of you know, new and, and better ways of trying to organize um, countries together on that. Um, so it's definitely the, the weak leg of the stool. The, mm. there's, there's no two ways about that. I, I mean, I'm delighted that there is an emphasis on mitigation um, because that does reinforce that sense of urgency um, and of course, you can't do the mitigation unless you're doing some pretty big um, economic and technological um, transformation as well. So that's all good. Um, but we've got to get far, far uh, more sophisticated and serious about loss and adaptation. Um, because it's the developing countries, which of course are the worst place for that, the least resourced, and therefore need the greatest help. And of course, they, um, typically around the equator, where um, climate change um, is going to be extreme, uh, particularly temperature-wise, um, making places in uninhabitable um, in various ways. So that is still a big weakness in the overall um, community of nations response to the climate crisis. Wonderful. Um, thank you again, Rod. Um, that is so interesting to hear all that vast, um, covering that vast area. Um, and um, thanks again for being there to report back to us and, and also, of course, being available specifically to talk to us this evening. Um, really, you know, huge thanks. Um, and when are you heading back? Um, I'm heading 
back slowly at the weekend. I've got a couple of stops on the way, not the least of which uh, because I need to change planes in Dubai anyway. Um, I'm actually going to the World Expo. Um, I've got two nights, one day in Dubai, and I'm going to go and see the New Zealand. I'm, I, I might see some other things, but my particular goal is to go and see the New Zealand Pavilion at, at the Expo because I went to Aichi in Japan in 2005 and to Shanghai in 2010. And it was really fascinating to see um, how much our expression of nationhood changed over that time. Aichi was fabulous, but very um, low keyed, uh, but a huge hit with people going. Um, Shanghai was much more sophisticated and, and an even greater expression. And uh, I've seen you know, some of the information about the Dubai Pavilion, but I, I just I kind of want to just kind of see how it's playing. And um, I'm going to be taking my um, youngest sister and her husband and my young nephew and niece who live in Dubai out to dinner at the Tiaki restaurant in the New Zealand Pavilion next Wednesday evening. <laughs> and then I'll get on the plane. And then you, you've got your, your, your time in MIQ. So I hope that's uh, um, bearable. <laughs> bit of rest. Um, oh, but I, I had this um, all this reading lined up for two weeks, and now it's only a week plus three days in isolation at home. I'm very happy about that. But I was going to do all this reading after I'd had a bit of a sleep. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks again, Rod, um, and thank you everybody for joining, um, and thanks for the excellent questions. Um, so we just a, a quick plug for a couple of events that are happening um, in the SBN world. Uh, we've got a couple more of our climate action workshops that are still um, available to come along on the 18th and on the 24th. Um, so please check out our events page on our website for that. And also, and more importantly, we've got the Sustainable Business Awards um, on the 25th of November. This is for obvious reasons going to be an online event. It's free for all. Um, so again, you can um, register for that on our, our website. So please check check out that. Um, we've already had over 500. It's probably gone up by 100 or so, I would imagine. Um, so that's it from, from us, from me. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Rod. Safe travels home. Apo marie kakite anō. We'll just finish with a, a karakia. Unuhia, unuhia. Unuhia ki te uru tapu nui. Kia wātea, kia māma te nāko. Te tīnana, te wairua ki te aratangata. Koia rā e rongo. Whaka irihia aki ke runga. Kia tīna, tīna. Huie, taikie. See ya.